Welcome, welcome everyone. Glad you are joining us. So we're going to give it a minute just so that everyone who's planning to join us is able to hear us all. I still see the numbers crawling up, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. Welcome, welcome. In the chat, we have uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our uh, website. It looks like we are starting to slow down on uh, people entering, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. It is such a pleasure to have you here with us today. I hope wherever you are at, it is sunny and beautiful. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar. My name is Alejandra Chamberlain, and I'm one of the three county leads for Homeless Technical Assistance Center, also known as HETAC. Today, we are presenting on supporting immigrants and refugee students. And we have the pleasure of being joined with, um, with Karen Rice, who is the Senior Program Manager of Education Initiatives with Schoolhouse Connection. Krishan Campbell, Child Development Supervisor with the Stanislaus County Office of Education. And Michelle Einspar, with, um, who's a program manager with the Office of Children and Youth in Transition within the Sacramento, oh, forgive me, within the San Diego Unified School District. Apologize. Housekeepings. So before we get started, please note that there is a chat function as well as Q&A. Feel free to use either or to your discretion. We will do our very best to answer all questions as they come in. And if not, we will hope to get some information out for pending questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our HETAC website, which is in the chat already. Any resources shared during this webinar will be sent to you if you have registered um, after the webinar. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Karen Rice with Schoolhouse Connections. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. I am joining you from Madison, Wisconsin, so it is not bright and sunny here today, um, but I hope the weather is wonderful where you are at. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we are going to spend about the next 45 minutes or so um, talking about supporting immigrant and migrant students experiencing homelessness. Um, so I'm going to give you just kind of a big picture, broad overview. Um, and then I look forward to learning more from my colleagues as well that are joining on this call. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, just briefly about Schoolhouse Connection. Um, this is a picture of our team, although we have grown since this picture was taken. Uh, but we are a national nonprofit that works to overcome homelessness through education. So we provide a lot of advocacy, both at the state and federal level, as well as really practical technical assistance for districts, um, early childhood programs, higher education, and just kind of the gamut of, of K-12. So um, my area is working with K-12, um, and I come from a background of being a McKinney-Vento State Coordinator, as well as a liaison in a school district before that. Um, and also in the school district, I was the bilingual family liaison and worked a lot with our, our immigrant and migrant community. So it's just a little bit about my background. And um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, so just kind of an agenda of where we're headed today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the language of immigration and just talk through kind of some of the terms, because I know that sometimes we use them interchangeably or we're not totally sure exactly what they mean. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I want to spend some time focusing on the educational rights of undocumented children and youth, um, and we'll bring in McKinney-Vento to that and talk through that. Um, and then I will provide you some updates on um, some of the kind of trickier things that are constantly changing. So what I have for you is accurate um, as of last week when the slides were finished, but is ever-changing. So we'll talk through that um, and kind of what your role in supporting um, students experiencing homelessness is regarding that. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so just a little bit about the language of immigration. Um, an immigrant is a person who moves to another country and their plan is to stay permanently. So a lot of the families that we have coming to the US, um, that is their plan and they kind of do fall under this immigrant category that they come with the intent to stay. Um, 
and just want to kind of the difference between immigrant and migrant, I think is really important. A migrant student is a family who comes for the purpose of agricultural, temporary agricultural se or seasonal work. Um, they may become immigrants, they may end up planning to stay and they may take that, but, um, but the purpose is really those moves based on that agricultural and seasonal work. Um, a refugee is someone who has left their home country due to a fear of persecution, whether that's for race, religion, um, nationality, membership in a particular social group. Um, and they're not in the US, but they're going through that initial immigration process. And so I think that's really an important key distinction of a refugee is that they are, they are beginning that um, immigration process from a different country, not necessarily their home country, but they may be in another country going through that, starting that initial process. Um, and different from that is an asylee, um, and that is really a refugee who is in the U.S. going through that initial immigration process. So it's someone who is here and then is petitioning, um, petitioning that immigration process and beginning that while in the U.S. Um, so kind of just an important distinction. I know those two are tricky terms that sometimes we use interchangeably, but they're not. Um, and so it's it's just kind of different thinking in terms of where the, the person is when they're initiating that immigration process to be in the US. Um, a parolee or humanitarian parolee is someone who receives temporary legal status to enter the US. Um, and they're typically not eligible for the same services as refugees. Um, refugees, because of their application for the immigration process, also typically have some support beyond um, that process. And so um, someone who is a parolee doesn't have that same support. And then of course, of course unaccompanied children. Um, we know that these are older children and youth that are coming to the US without a parent or legal guardian with them. Um, and so in this case, it's, we're referring to their immigration status when we call them unaccompanied youth or unaccompanied children. Um, I, the term is often alien children. Um, I don't like that term. So <laughs> um, we kind of avoid using that at Schoolhouse and, and think that that's not the best way to talk about our kids. Um, so unaccompanied youth in this case is referring to their immigration status. And of course, under McKinney-Vento, unaccompanied homeless youth are also children and youth experiencing homelessness, not under the care of their parent or legal guardian. And so there, there's likely some overlap in those. Go on to the next slide. All right, so just to talk through some rights of undocumented children and youth, because this is a question that we get a lot. Um, so any child or youth that's living in the US has a right to attend public schools. Um, it doesn't matter their immigration status, schools can't ask. So if a student comes in to register or enroll with their family, um, the school cannot ask, are you here as a refugee, an asylee? Are you undocumented? You know, show me your green card or your visa or whatever. Those questions just cannot be a factor in that student's enrollment. Um, we do not want to discourage students from seeking enrollment. We want kids to be in school where we can be supporting and educating them. Um, similarly, schools cannot ask for a social security number. Um, that information is it's, it's just, just not allowable. You wouldn't ask for another family um, for their social security number. So that information um, is not a part of the enrollment. It cannot affect enrollment. And I think that's really important when we think about, we wanna get our kids in school, right? Um, we also wanna make sure that schools are a safe place. And we wanna make sure families know that schools are a safe place. Um, so when we think about you know law enforcement or ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, I think now they're going more under the Customs and Border Patrol umbrellas, um, but we want to make sure that we're we're not notifying anyone, we're not talking about that, and we're letting families know that schools really are a safe place, um, and that they can be there without fear of their documentation status. So I think when we think about this overall with our children and youth, it's really important to know that that we don't need to know. We don't need to know what their status is. We don't need to know. They may openly share that, but it does not factor into getting that child or youth in school. Go on to the next slide. So I want to talk through undocumented children and youth and McKinney-Vento. So what I'm sharing in these slides, um, these numbers that are listed here, um, they're for all students identified as McKinney-Vento, but we know that often families who are coming um, from other countries may be doubling up with friends and family. They may be in McKinney-Vento situations. So it's certainly not just undocumented children and youth. It can be any immigrant um, or migrant student. 
Um, but in general, we are looking at um, children and youth who are living in emergency. Oops, I think. Sorry, can you go back one slide? We skipped one slide. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the McKinney-Vento Act, of course, covers children and youth who lack fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. So that can be any student. Um, but when we think about our undocumented students in particular, or our immigrant and migrant students, we want to make sure that we're being really intentional about identifying these, these children and youth. Um, so this data shared, as I said, is for all children and youth, but certainly we know that our undocumented children and youth, um, as well as our our other immigrant and migrant youth are can fall into these categories as well. Um, so just to share a little bit of updated data that we have, I mean, the 2020-2021 school year, 77% of the children and youth that were identified across the country um, under McKinney-Vento are in these shared housing situations. And so sharing housing, of course, um, is living in someone else's housing that's because of a loss of housing, economic hardship, similar reason it might be um, fleeing domestic violence, it might be coming from another country and not having anywhere else to go. Um, so it really is the majority of our students. And when we think about our immigrant and migrant students, we know that so many are in these shared housing situations. And so in a few slides, we're going to get into talking a little bit about those cultural considerations of what that doubled up housing um, really can look like and, and how to parse out um, what might be a McKinney-Vento situation um, versus what might be just a multi-generational family. 8% um, in the 2020-2021 school year um, were identified as living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or campgrounds. Can you go to the next slide? And then in emergency or transitional shelters, 11% of identified McKinney-Vento students. Um, we also know that living in public or private places that are not actually supposed to be used as accommodations, um, that's a smaller percentage. Um, but then 4% of our students are living in cars or parks, ab abandoned buildings, substandard housing. Um, and I think that substandard piece is really important to think about because um, we, we, I hear often that it, substandard feels like a really subjective thing under McKinney-Vento of like, how do we determine that? How do we know who makes the decision of what substandard housing is? Um, and so I wanna just share an example that I heard recently from someone in Massachusetts. And she shared that they have had just a really significant increase of families coming from other countries, that now they're finding that families are um, renting out on a rotating basis, like closet spaces within other living situations. And so they may rent a space during the day, and that's where families are, um, they have a, their own space, I mean, closet space within a larger living situation. And then another family uses that space at night. And so when we think about things like that, like that's really, first of all, you can't have a family in a closet. You don't have access to um, access to regular living spaces. Students can't be getting a good night's sleep in that closet, you know? So when we think about that, we wanna think about, is that probably a substandard living situation? Um, and, you know, is uh, what about utilities? Do they have access to heat and electricity? Um, do they have access to a clean space? Do they have access to a place where there's not any, um, any real imminent danger. So, um, so that's kind of how we look at substandard and how we think about that, um, particularly in, in terms of our immigrant and migrant students who are living in some of those situations. Um, and then of course our unaccompanied youth, I mentioned under McKinney-Vento, that's different um, than what we think about unaccompanied youth when we talk about it in terms of immigration, um, but there is that overlap. And so we're looking at youth who are living in these circumstances and also not under the care of a parent or legal guardian. So when I was in a district, I had a lot of youth that came and they were living with other family members, temporarily staying with an aunt or an uncle or a friend. And they were moving around quite a bit between different family members and different friends. And so those were youth who were unaccompanied in their immigration sense, but also unaccompanied and homeless as they didn't have a location um, that was really any kind of permanent place for them. Go to the next slide. All right, so when we talk about determining eligibility, we wanna really look at um, those living situations that we just talked through. Um, we can think about, you know, did the family lose housing due to natural disasters? Um, was there violence or war? Um, things like that. And I think, you know, a lot of the reasons that our families leave other countries can really be a reason why someone might be eligible for McKinney-Vento. Um, and we'll kind of talk through more of those different pieces when we're talking about families from Ukraine or from Afghanistan. 
Um, so we want to know where would they go if they had to leave what they're staying, where they're staying. Um, we want to really look at that nighttime residence and that housing situation of that family. Uh, we don't want to ask anything that would really jeopardize the family situation. Um, again, thinking through, like, we don't want to talk about their immigration status. We don't need to ask. We cannot ask about that. Um, but we really want to make sure that the, the way that we're approaching some of these conversations um, is really sensitive and really, um, it's, we're asking in a way that's helping us to gather information while also letting the family know that we're trying to do it in a supportive way. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about sponsors. Um, but I do want to say that as we hear from people at Schoolhouse talking about, well, the student is here, they have a sponsor, um, that doesn't change our analysis under McKinney-Vento. So we're not looking at that sponsor as a legal guardian, we're not looking at that sponsor as, um, you know, kind of a permanent placement, but we're going to talk a little more about that later on in our slides. All right, so I mentioned we wanted to touch on um, the cultural considerations of being doubled up. And this is a question that we hear a lot at Schoolhouse of how do we know, because we know that in so many cultures and with so many families, there is a value of that multi-generational living situation. And families do often choose to get to live together because of that. And so our answer across the board at Schoolhouse is you have to look at every situation individually, whether or not that's a cultural value or whether it might be a cultural norm. Um, you really wanna look at each of those situations on an individual basis. We have someone on our team at Schoolhouse who has worked a lot with um, native students on a reservation. And her response to this is always the same. It doesn't matter if grandma's a part of the family and if grandma's a part of the picture, if that student is living with grandma because they lost their housing or they had nowhere else to go, it doesn't matter in that situation that it's a multi-generational household. It's because that student um, didn't have another, another place to be. And so that student would need to be identified. And so just kind of thinking very broadly across all of our families, um, we wanna look at really be, pay particular attention to those multi-generational living situations. So we wanna know who's included on the lease, who's contributing to household costs. Again, does everyone have an adequate space to sleep? Um, when I think about some of the migrant camps that I visited uh, when I was working with migrant education, that was a big one for a lot of the children and youth that were in those situations that they didn't have their own space. They weren't, you know, they might, they were sleeping on the floor in the middle of a living room where there were, mul where there were multiple other families that were residing. And um, so we really want to look at that adequacy piece. Um, we also really want to consider, is that living arrangement for everyone's mutual benefit? Or is it really because that family or that student has nowhere else to go? Um, we know that there can be times when it really is a, a, an arrangement and a mutually beneficial arrangement, and so it's not McKinney-Vento. Um, I worked with a family a number of years ago who came from Mexico, and um, three brothers got together with their families, and they said, this is our plan. We're going to move to Wisconsin, and we're going to buy a house together, and our families are going to live together, and that's how we're going to afford to do it. And also that's how we're gonna support each other through childcare and school and just all of the kind of family pieces. And that was an arrangement that they had. They had a sufficient space in the house for all members of the family to be. And so situations like that are not McKinney-Vento situations, but I think those are more rare than families who are moving to live with other family or friends uh, while they're trying to figure out where else they could be or they're working on getting other housing. A key question for this is really, who else in the household is looking for their own place to live, right? We want to know, where would you be if you couldn't be here? Are you trying to find another place? Um, I often hear from families who, like, we're in a new country, we don't speak the language, we don't know, you know, systems to try to get jobs or to try to make money and to have an income. So we have to live with our family members because we're trying to figure all this out as we navigate being in a new place. Um, and so then again, looking at was one family already living there and that family, another family moved in. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces to kind of parse out with this, with the doubled up and kind of the cultural piece to this. But we really want to pay particular attention to each of these situations on an individual basis. Again, thinking through why are they here? What was the plan? Was there an arrangement ahead of time? And would they be living like this if there were other options and if they were able to get their own place? Um, or they had they had the means to do that or the the knowledge of kind of the systems to do that. Um, so 
of course, that that can be applied to any McKinney Vento family and knowing those things, but but it's particularly important to pay attention to kind of that that cultural piece and not just to make blanket statements about well, you know, we know a lot of families in this culture have multi generational households, so that's just how it is, and that's fine, um, and we're not going to identify them. All right, so let's talk about some strategies and best practices. Um, this is this is my some of my favorite parts of this presentation because I get to share with you some examples of things that are happening in other districts. Um, so also, I will say that if you have really cool things happening in your district, you are welcome to share those. I think it's a great opportunity for us all to learn from each other. Um, so. To begin with, identifying immigrant families experiencing homelessness. We know that families coming from other countries may or may not speak English, and so it's really important and really critical to be posting and publishing information in multiple languages. So figuring out what are the languages in your district or in your area and spreading that information in as many of those languages as possible. It's important to really consider what the best way to express homelessness is in other languages. We know even in English, homelessness carries a stigma and families don't necessarily want to use that term to refer to themselves, but it, there also may be challenges with the translation of that. Um, and so we really want to consider, are there best, there best things, words that we can use in another language to express the same meaning um, so that families don't feel that sense of stigma and they feel more open and willing to have some of those conversations. Um, discretion and trust, of course, are essential. We want to make sure that families uh, we're building relationships with families and being intentional in our interactions with them um, so that they know that that we as school staff are safe to talk to and it's a safe space for their kids to be. Um, so just to share a little bit about a couple of examples. Well, one example in particular with this um, disseminating information about McKinney Vento to families. There is a school district in Ohio um, and they have found they have it's a smaller district, but they have had a lot of newcomer students lately, and they were finding that a lot of their families um, had some literacy challenges. And so handing them a housing questionnaire or handing them information about McKinney Vento was just not working. Families were struggling to read it because Spanish, the Spanish that where their families were coming from, Spanish wasn't their first language. It was their second language. They spoke an indigenous language first, and so they didn't have the same literacy skills in Spanish. Um, and so they decided to utilize an interpreter um, so that they could give the family written information, but then also have someone to really talk through what each part of McKinney Vento and that housing questionnaire really meant. And they did that in a way, um, in a verbal conversation, to help make sure that families really understood what questions they were asking, um, what the information they were trying to gather, um, and why. And so families felt comfortable having those conversations. Um, another great strategy is collaborating across programs, particularly to provide wraparound services, but I will say I think this is also really important when it comes to identification. Um, so thinking through Title I Part C is what migrant education falls under, um, Title IV, Title I Part A, of course, but Title III also we know that Title III services are um, an important part of our schools, and so um, there is a school in Tennessee, um, Metro Nashville Public Schools, and they have a really robust connection between their Title III program and their McKinney Vento program. Um, and so they have approximately 30% of their McKinney Vento referrals that they get come from their Title III staff. And the reason they do that is because they very intentionally do cross training between programs so that when families are coming in, they're not only identifying them under McKinney Vento, but they're also saying, oh, English is not your first language. We want to connect you with our Title III staff right away so your child's receiving language support as well. And so they've worked really, really hard to have that cross collaboration. Um, and it's helped to increase the numbers of students that they're, that they're identifying both under McKinney Vento and then also um, in their Title III programs. Of course, providing families with information and support they can access. Again, thinking through um, what are the best ways to share information and to have conversations with families and to really build those connections. And relationships with community partners. You all know this in your work of supporting students and families, how critical those community partners are. And I think it's especially important when you're serving families who speak other languages, they may feel more connected to a service provider um, who has helped support them to get housing and childcare um, in their native language. And so if you can have those robust partnerships, 
and that person can work with the family then to connect them to school. It, I think it serves to really show, oh, this person who's been supporting me at this community agency trusts this person at school. Okay, I can trust them as well. Um, and then also you have connections of who to make referrals to for those non-academic needs. Um, so those partnerships are really critical. Go to the next slide, thanks. I think it's also really important to consider the unique needs of migrant families experiencing homelessness. So we talk a lot about our immigrant families, but um, on top of um, on top of some of the barriers that immigrant families have, migrant students also have a lot of really unique barriers because of their mobility due to the agricultural and seasonal work. Um, so critical to this, I worked with migrant education for a lot of years um, at the state level, and we really worked to try to figure out the best way to train our migrant recruiters on McKinney-Bento. Um, so they had a really basic um, baseline understanding, and we certainly didn't expect them to do any identification. But when they were meeting with families and they were at camps and they were at visiting with employers and job sites and work sites, and they would kind of hear those key phrases, they knew, um, okay, I might need to make a referral to a homeless liaison for this student. Um, again, it's that cross collaboration and cross training. Um, there is a district in Colorado who has worked really hard with their regional office. Their regional office houses their migrant recruiters. And so they have done a lot of cross training and they've developed this shared database. And to be honest, I don't know anything about the, techn the technology side of how they did this with the database, but they've got a, a, a system where they can be identifying students under both programs. So they both have access to that information. So if they meet with a family and they see, oh, this family is, is, has, um, is eligible under our migrant education program, but I also think they're eligible under McKinney-Vento. They can be sharing that information in a way that really helps to systematize um, their identification work. And so um, it's a great project. And at some point, I hope to learn more about the technology side of that so I can tell you more about the data sharing piece and how they worked that out. Um, but again, it's that cross-training and cross-collaboration that's helped them to really piece together. Most of our students are eligible under McKinney-Vento because of the location that we're at and the situations that we have. Let's make sure we're connecting back and forth so we can provide the maximum amount of support to students. Um, so I would say the clear process is really important for that migrant education, those migrant recruiters to be making referrals. Um, in Wisconsin, for example, we have summer only migrant programs. And so it was a little bit different when we were starting to um, talk about that collaboration between McKinney-Vento. Um, but there's still opportunities to make those referrals. Students are often in Wisconsin, for example, at the end of the school year and at the beginning of the school year. And so um, we could still be connecting with our homeless liaisons and providing that support. Um, and then also helping with that transition as students are moving between school districts and moving between states, um, homeless liaisons can be talking and providing that so continued support. Uh, we also know that, of course, preschool students um, under McKinney-Vento have access to um, preschool services and migrant and seasonal Head Start programs are a great way to connect uh, migrant students, migrant children um, to those programs if they exist nearby. So um, that purple is a link that will take you to um, those that program information. So um, I think you will have access to the slides and can follow that link if that's helpful. So we do a lot with our HCY at Schoolhouse. Um, and so I wanted to take a little bit of time to share some of the great ways that, um, that districts around the country are using their ARP HCY funds to support their immigrant and migrant families. And I think a lot of these things are easily, do, easily replicable. Um, and so I like to share these just as an example of things to consider. Um, so Middletown, Rhode Island, um, they have worked to hire a family services coordinator to support their families. Um, they have a contract with boys and girls clubs to provide wraparound services because they were finding that so many of their immigrant families didn't have the students didn't have places to go after school and they really needed that extra support. Um, so they established these contracts and then hired their service coordinator to help connect families so that they knew that when students were enrolling in their district that they had someone they could talk to about what their after school needs were and help connect them to appropriate programming. And they've been really successful in supporting um, their immigrant families in the community with these services. Um, in Ohio, there is a district that's using their ARPHCY funds to purchase bikes to support their attendance of their immigrant students. 
And this is absolutely one of my favorite examples because I've never heard of anyone doing this before I talked with this district. Um, so they have a large population of students from Guatemala and um, recently arrived in this district. And they were noticing that anytime it, there was rain or snow or the temperature got below a certain point, their students just weren't coming to school. And so they started to have conversations with their students and learned that in the communities where they were coming from, that was just, that was the norm and they just didn't do that. And so um, they didn't wanna be walking to school in the rain. They didn't wanna be walking to school when it was cold. They just pretty much didn't wanna be walking to school in general. And they were struggling with kids in that walk zone. Um, and of course, transportation challenges with school buses and things. So they wanted to think of a really creative way to support their attendance. So they use their RFHCY funds to purchase bikes. Um, they have a lot of other students in their community that bike to school because they have a big walk zone. And so it was really natural to try to fold in um, some of that with their immigrant students. And they saw their attendance with those students just really increase because it was an easier way for the kids to get to school. Biking to school was quicker than walking. And so on days when it was colder, they weren't outside as much, they could ride quickly to school and leave their bikes um, just like other students. And so I, I thought that was a great idea. It was one that I had not heard of. And so the bikes are um, purchased and housed at the school and then given out to students um, as they, they need that transportation support. Um, in Nebraska, um, there's a district, Grand Island, that used their RBHCY funds to hire a parent liaison, a bilingual parent liaison, to support families in their early learning center. Um, so they, it's specifically targeted toward their early childhood students to really connect those young children to summer resources. Um, but of course, any family who comes in that needs language assistance, um, during the summer, they're also supporting those families and providing community resources, connecting with their, their academic programs that are happening, and just really trying to be more intentional about connecting with their families um, who speak other languages. Uh, there's a charter school in New Mexico uh, that uses funds to hire a bilingual benefits navigator. So they were noticing a lot of their families were really struggling to navigate housing systems in their communities. Um, you know, the applications were in English, trying to meet with people in English was a real challenge. And so they hired someone to really support families through that process. So the, the navigator works with families to complete housing applications and then to walk them through that process and to be there not just as an interpreter, but as a support person. Um, and then connecting them back to school and to the resources at school. Um, and so really acting kind of as that liaison also between school and community. Um, this is another one that I really, um, I love to share because I think it's it's really unique. Um, in Minnesota, there's a district that's using their funds to provide mental health supports for their immigrant high school students. So they were finding that a lot of their older high school age um, students were coming and they just couldn't engage in class and they were really struggling to learn. And as they started to have conversations, realized that a lot of them were really trying to process the trauma of their immigration experience. And that was preventing them from, from really engaging in school because that was heavy on their minds and their, their living situations. And so aside from just their immigration experience, and all, they were also experiencing homelessness. And so they worked with a bilingual bicultural therapist in the community to contract to provide those mental health supports. And so they provide small group counseling to um, their immigrant high school students who are also experiencing homelessness to really navigate and manage the trauma of their immigration experiences so they can engage in school and be ready to learn when they're in their classes. Um, so those are just a couple of examples and I know um, it, you know, it can be the staffing challenges. There's a lot of things that, you know, capacity building and things like that, that can be a real struggle, but I think just in general, these are some really great examples of how to really support our immigrant and migrant students um, who are experiencing homelessness with some really unique ideas. And actually you can skip the question slide because I wanna make sure we get through the content and then we'll come back to that. Um, so I mentioned early childhood and early learners and just wanna um, spend a minute talking about this. Um, our undocumented children have the right to attend state and LEA preschool programs. So again, exactly what we talked about with children coming to enroll in school, if a child is enrolling in a district preschool program, a district 4K program, for example, we're not asking about immigration status. We don't need to know. They still have the right to attend and participate in those programs. 
Head Start and early Head Start programs may serve undocumented children and families, and they may have their own requirements. Um, I will be honest, I'm not as familiar with their requirements, but I um, encourage you to connect if you have Head Start and early Head Start programs in your community to find out what those might be. As far as childcare goes, um, only qualified immigrant children um, qualify for those subsidies. So basically what that means is if the parents are undocumented, but the child is documented, um, then they would be eligible for those child care subsidies. So it doesn't matter the immigration status of the parent. Um, so if there's parents that came and, and had a child while they were here, that child would be eligible. Again, I would er encourage you to connect with people in your community to talk more about that. So higher education, go on the other end of the spectrum now with our older kids. Um, I do want to point out that this information is always ever changing as well. Um, this, uh, to be very diplomatic, this swings with the political pendulum. Um, so kind of depending on who's in charge of what and in what office, this information may be subject to change. But as of right now, this is the most accurate information that we have. Um, so undocumented youth can apply to public colleges and universities in every state except Alabama and South Carolina. Um, not all undocumented youth are eligible for in-state tuition in these schools. Um, and there's a list at the bottom. I know in Wisconsin, um, prior to a political change a number of years ago, our students were eligible for in-state tuition and now they are not in Wisconsin. So again, this kind of changes with the political um, landscape. Um, thinking through federal financial aid in that FAFSA, Undocumented youth are not eligible for any federal financial aid. Um, however, if a child is documented, if even if their parents are undocumented, they are and can apply. Um, and I would encourage you to um, have those conversations delicately because they can be really challenging. When I was in a district, I worked with a student who thought that she was documented and in the process of completing the FAFSA found out that she wasn't. And so, um, so this can be really a, a really kind of challenging conversation to have with students and families. And so as you think through um, kind of how to, how to navigate this, I would just um, urge you to do that cautiously and, and just know that um, sometimes this can be a, an eye-opening conversation for a student that can create some barriers um, to things like financial aid. Uh, okay, I will leave you with that on higher education for now, but I do want to just briefly mention that Schoolhouse has a scholarship. Um, it is currently closed for this year, but will open again in the fall. And so um, just maybe tuck this in the back of your mind for future. Um, but students who are undocumented are eligible for our scholarship at Schoolhouse. And so um, we want to just spread the word as much as we can. We have been trying to uh, really get as many different students represented in our scholarship program as we can. Um, so one of the one of the great things about Schoolhouse and kind of the jewel in our crown is the scholarship program. And so we have um, we have scholars every year that join our, our scholarship family. And we provide not only financial assistance, but also case management through that transition to college and then through those college years as well. And we stay connected with many of the students once they graduate or they move on to other things. Um, so this is something that undocumented students can access and we just um, really would love for you to kind of keep this in mind. Of course, we'll begin to advertise it again in the fall, um, but I always like to mention it because sometimes it feels like there's not a lot of options for students who are undocumented and this is, this is a great one. All right, so here are immigration updates <laughs> and um, these are my colleague Patricia's slides, and I appreciate that she put in giant letters in purple that this is constantly changing. So if you get nothing else from that, I will say um, we have the most accurate information we can provide you, but it may change at any moment. And I think your role as, as staff who work with students experiencing homelessness is to know these things exist and to know where to make those referrals. So we want to make sure that you understand um, just the very basic surface level of these different pieces, um, but know that you don't have to be experts in them. You just need to know where to go to refer families. Um, I think that's really kind of the key of where can you get those legal services? How can you connect families to, um, to those service providers who can go more in depth and figure out what families might be eligible for or what their situation is? So temporary protected status, this is one that is constantly changing. 
the list of current eligible countries can change from day to day. So as of the time when I made these slides, like I said, this is the most accurate information I could provide you. It's possible if I went back and looked at the, the website um, that this list would be different as of a few days post making the slides. Um, so just know that this is one of those that, that are constantly changing. Um, so with temporary protective status, um, people from these eligible countries do have the right to be in the US, but they don't have a lot of rights to anything else. So they still have to apply for work authorizations. Um, but if you have families that you're working with who are coming from these countries, we encourage you to just know that temporary protected status or TPS is a thing. And again, find out who it is in your communities that you can connect them to for more information and to help them walk through um, processes to apply for that work authorization. Um, it's really important to know who those reputable immigration attorneys are um, and to know what resources are available. I will say I do know a number of families. I have heard um, from various people across the country that they, um, they know who not to refer their families to and they know who they've had challenges in their community with of providing accurate immigration um, information. And so it's really important to know what resources are the best ones to be referring families to about this specific information. All right, so families coming from Ukraine. Um, this Ukraine is currently listed on those TPS countries, the eligible countries, so the temporary protected status. Um, but there is also a program, this is really interesting, uh, where people can sponsor families from Ukraine. So this is all, of, of course, this program has developed as a result of the war happening there. Um, and so it's typically a wealthy family in the U.S. who's willing to take on all the financial responsibility for two years for a family to enter the U.S. Um, so this means that families can come to the U.S. and aren't really aren't limited by those TPS or so the temporary protected status rules. They can access health insurance, work authorization, and it gives them more legal rights. Um, there's not a lot of families who are who are here under this program, um, under this support program, because a there's a huge wait list, um, and also it's it's there's not a lot of families signing up to take on financial responsibility for another family for two years. And so you sign a legal document as that supporter. Um, and that we've heard of celebrities and famous people doing this, but I think there's not, there's not a, um, it's not a great wealth of families that are able to do something like that for a two year financial responsibility. Um, so just know that that program does exist. Um, I will say, Supporters, when, they, when they're participating in this program, and they sign a legal document saying they'll provide financial support for those two years. And so they're taking on that responsibility. However, we know that sometimes best laid plans, you know, best ideas, families in this program can still be eligible for making evento. So I would say, again, it's that case by case. They may have come here with a supporter. Something may have happened. There may have been a falling out or the family couldn't. Um, continue to support them or whatever it is, um, but there may be families who who came through this Uniting for Ukraine program um, who are now eligible for McKinney Vento. So in theory, the supporter provides that housing, but again, not always, and it's kind of that um, that can be subject to change. So families who have come from Afghanistan, I know this is not happening as frequently as it was a few years ago when there was um, a number of families and quite a few families evacuated, um, but there is a special immigrant visa um, for Afghans who are employed by or on behalf of the US government. Um, that humanitarian parole, again, this was the case by case basis. In Wisconsin, we got about 13,000 um, folks from Afghanistan who arrived at one of our bases, our military bases in Wisconsin. Um, we really looked at immediately when they arrived, are they enrolling in our schools? What's their living situation? Where are they headed? What kind of support do they have? Um, most did not stay in Wisconsin. So it was, it was um, there was not much we could do to support them, but um, it is really likely that a high percentage of these families um, end up in mckinney Vento situations. So when refugee families, um, Sorry if you can hear the snow plow outside my window. Uh, it just got really loud. Um, when families come to through these programs from Afghanistan, they may have refugee resettlement services, um, but those are not necessarily long-term supports. Or we we have heard of families um, who were, have, were put up in a hotel by the Office of, of Refugee um, Services. 
And then they kind of have to figure it out after that, or, um, you know, they pay for it for a short period of time, and then the family is on their own, or they provide temporary housing for them. And so while a family arriving from Afghanistan may not initially be in a McKinney-Vento situation, um, their situation may become that once they no longer have that support. Um, so again, case by case basis, but but it's likely that families, you know, as they lose the support from refugee resettlement services um, that they become in McKinney-Vento situations or they might have to move in with other family or friends to, um, to really be able to um, have a place to go until they can figure out their plan. All right, and then very briefly, um, deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, this is not completely new, um, but it, people are still eligible. People are still considered um, DACA students. Um, so there is the option to apply for renewals right now. Um, however, anybody that has applied for DACA needs to renew their status, can apply, but they're not processing anything. So of course, this is wrapped up in a legal battle of um, the federal government figuring out what is actually allowable with this and what will happen with the future of the program. Um, but this was a really great option when it first started for students, older students, to apply and to have a work authorization and to feel like they had a little bit more protection um, with their situation. So um, when I worked in a district, I helped hundreds of students apply for this program and they were able to then go out and get jobs with work authorizations to support their families. It opened up some additional doors for financial aid for school and for post-secondary planning. Um, so I am hopeful. I don't know how hopeful to be, but I am hopeful that the future of this program will continue um, because I think it really, it's a temporary option for students until we can figure out how to navigate our immigration system differently in this country. Um, but at least it does give a little bit of, of options for students. So you may find students who say that they're DACA students um, and probably most of them are needing to reapply. And again, they can apply, but their applications are not being processed right now. All right, and then finally, um, the public charge rule. And I will admit this is not my area of expertise. Um, so I'm happy to look for more information about public charge if that is helpful to you. Um, but I do wanna say that for a while there was a stigma about um, school services being included in this. And so basically what the public charge rule meant is that if you were getting public benefits, you were not gonna be able to get a visa, you were not gonna be able to get work authorization, things like that. Um, and there were a lot of families for a while that were really nervous about applying for free lunch or receiving free lunch at school and thinking that that was included in public charge. Um, so just want to say that McKinney-Vento services, free school meals, um, Head Start programming, those are all not included in this. And so if you have families that say to you, well, you know, I heard this is a thing and so I don't want to, like, don't identify my family. Um, you know, we don't want to be under McKinney-Vento. Um, just it's good to know that, that that is not included and to be able to encourage families that McKinney-Vento supports will not affect this at all. Um, again, I would say if you're looking for more information, I'm happy to find more information for you and talk with my, my colleagues um, or find someone in your community who is can provide legal advice um, on this. Okay, that was a lot of information <laughs> in a very short amount of time. Um, so I can see that there's questions coming in in the chat. Um, I don't know, Alejandra, do you want me to try to answer some of these or I know we need to also- I, I think we'll wait until the end just because we want to make sure we have enough time for the other two presenters. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Karen. That was lovely for um, everyone to hear and have the foundation set for our transition to our two presenters who are representing um, two LEAs within California. They'll be sharing their experience and what they have learned along the way. And I believe, okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Krishan Campbell. I'm a child development supervisor here at the Stanislaus County Office of Education. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. A little bit about um, our department here at SCO. We are under the Child and Family Services Division. So we operate basically every early childhood education program between state and federal that you can imagine. 
with the exception, I know one for sure that we don't have is tribal Head Start. But other than that, we are contracted for just about every other state and federal um, ECE program out there. And we are actually spread across, we actually operate across eight counties, not just in Stanislaus County. And we cover the eight counties for our migrant Head Start and migrant early Head Start programs. Next slide. So a little bit about our area, we had a very, very large impact in our Turlock region, which is here in Stanislaus County. Um, the International Rescue Committee, or IRC, actually airlifted 623 refugees into Stanislaus County, directly into Turlock, which is about 10 minutes from our um, office here and one of our, our service areas. Um, most of them that, got, that came to this area were special immigrant visa holders from Afghanistan. And then we did have some refugees also come from Syria and Uganda. Um, we were mainly seeing men who worked alongside the U.S. Armed Forces, um, the SIV holders. And um, we found that often they served as interpreters for, um, you know, the U.S. and um other agencies in Afghanistan, which is why they were some of the first um, people out. Now, we do also have a large population of the asylees as well, who were, again, just immediately airlifted out and ended up here in our region as well. Next slide. So one of our purposes as we became aware of the situation unfolding um, so close to home for us was that there were many children, um, very young children in, in hotels and playing in the hotel parking lots, which is actually what brought the, the urgency to our attention. Um, so we actually reached out and partnered with uh, IRC. And with that, um, we explained to them what programs we have between our state and Head Start programs, and that our job was to ensure, you know, that these homeless children have their needs met. We were hearing, um, after seeing them play in busy parking lots, we were also hearing of food shortages and that they had been in hotels for up to six months at some, at some times because of the housing shortage here in Stanislaus County and in California as a whole. So in partnering with them, we, um, you know, really, expressed the services that Head Start um, could provide to them as far as assisting with medical and food and just supporting the family as a whole was our ultimate goal. Next slide. So when we first um, began, it was February of 2022, and 94% of the families were homeless at the time we began offering support. Um, as of October, and I know that these numbers have changed now, but um, 32 families and 26 children with various support services we were able to um, help. We enrolled 15 children in early education programs, um, mainly our Head Start programs in some of the different models. And I know that we do continue to receive some more children on our wait list that we're working on getting placed as well. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but for the number of young children that we had in this area, it's actually quite a few. Um, we felt that and, and we actually partnered with Prevention Programs, who is our homeless liaison here at the County Office of Education. And um, they had a really good handle on assisting the families with the school age children and advocating for them. And so that's when we partnered with them and stepped in to help the younger children and families as well. So um, a few of the things that I'll talk about is um, some of the enrollment events we did, the health and nutrition events we did, um, some of the deliveries we've done and other services that we're able to provide to the families. Next slide, please. So here's some pictures of our wonderful families. They just make me smile. This is actually one of the enrollment and health events. Our, it was our very first one that we held in March. And what that looks like is we had a hotel meeting room. Um, we did not know what to expect but we had families come and at that event, we were able to register them for our program. 
Um, that's what that center picture is. That's my family service, um, my family eligibility specialist. So she was directly entering them into our database to get them enrolled in Head Start. Along with that, we had our nurses and um, health technicians there to go over immunizations, come up with any um, follow-up from medical treatment that might be needed, which we learned was a huge issue, and um, get them ready to start in our program. Um, some of the other events we've done is um, in learning how significant some of the medical concerns were as um, one instance, we had a one-year-old who had a very severe heart condition that had not been followed up on since he arrived, which was almost eight months prior. And so learning these things, we actually partnered with um, Golden Valley Health Centers here in our area. And what they did for us is they will hold clinics for us as needed. We just contact them where our families, we are able to transport them there they're able to see our homeless and refugee slash asylee families, provide them with physicals that are needed, immunizations, any follow-up medical care, any health care plans that might be needed, as well as connecting them with any specialists for these more severe situations that we're seeing. Um, that's an ongoing partnership that we continue to have. In addition, we have a local dentist who is willing to support the families and do emergency, medical, um, emergency dental care if needed, as well as exams, because our um, providers in this area are also very, very backlogged because of COVID and getting everybody in and the necessary treatment was taking some time. Um, we've also done actually community drives and working with our prevention program, Homeless Liaison again, to where we have collected food um, from food banks and actually delivered it to the hotels where the families were staying because they did not, um, these hotel rooms were very basic, which they were grateful to have a roof over their head, but they didn't have kitchens in them. They were not allowed to cook in them. And so it was very, very limited as to what they could keep on hand. And then again, transportation was difficult getting them to, you know, a grocery store or um, somewhere to pick up food. So we actually learned that many of the families were eating convenience store food every night um, because that was the nearest walking place. And when you have two or three children and don't have a stroller, it makes it very difficult to be able to travel. At these events, we were also able to provide um, clothing and shoes for each of the school age and the um, younger early education children, our little ones. We were able to provide strollers to the families who needed them. And this is all just a community, um, you know, a community effort between our Office of Ed and different divisions that we were able to come together and support these families. Next slide, please. So here's just a little bit about our families that we've been seeing. Um, most of them, 97% were from Afghanistan, 3% were from Syria. We are, I do know that that number has changed. We have seen a rise in families um, coming from Syria and those areas as well. Very recently, we have had some more arrive. Um, the main languages that we're working with is Dari. Um, for the Afghan families. Some didn't, do speak Pashto and then Arabic for our Syrian families. And the main religions um, were Islam and then some Christianity as well. A little bit, a little bit about that, you can stay on this slide, that's fine. But a little bit about that is we, um, part of the initial um, assessment that we did on the situation was learning that we don't have many interpreters in this area that speak Dari and Pashto. Um, we have a few more that speak Arabic, um, but with that, we were actually able to locate and contract through our office with some of the parents um, who were interpreters back in Afghanistan. And what they do for us is they will accompany the families to medical appointments. They will do phone conversations with them. They will assist with um, for the families who are in our home visiting program, they assist with going to the home visit with our home educator to be able to translate. They've assisted with public benefits, basically anything we need them to do to translate for these families. They're either a phone call away or able to be on site with us to provide that support to the families. 
So that was a very, very key piece for us. Um, and it has actually been really beneficial because then it's also helping the families who were able to contract with because then they have a source of employment. Um, so prior to entering the United States and enrolling in Head Start, only 25% had access to health services. Our immunization rates were at 25%. 30% had access to educational services, and we had 0% for early intervention and special education services. So we could immediately see the need and the benefits of enrolling them in our program. Next slide, please. The programs that we were able to enroll them in, um, so we have a state home visiting program that is funded through our state that we operate as an early Head Start home base option. So that means that the families get a visit once a week for an hour and a half with a home educator. And then we offer two um, home based um, play groups, we call them, where they come. Um, we have a site that they come to that is set up much like a classroom where the children are able to interact with one another and the parents get some. Um, parent education and get to socialize that way. Um, we do also have early Head Start home base that some of them have gone into. These two are pretty much essentially the same, just the funding source is different. And then we do have some of our older ones, three and older who have gone into our regional Head Start um, classrooms. And that has been going fantastic. Um, we have several sites in the Turlock area. So the families who were settled there were able to enroll in those classrooms. We also have had a couple of families in our Modesto area and in kind of the outskirts, which we've also been able to enroll them into our regional Head Start programs. Next slide, please. So after, um, I like to say after we got in contact with our families and got them in our programs, you can see some of the differences here. So 75% had access to health and dental and nutrition services. Um, 52% health referrals submitted. So those were identified health needs that we were able to submit to either primary care providers or specialists to assist these families with getting seen. 14% um, of children were identified with a chronic illness. And again, we were able to help provide that follow-up. And then 43% of children needed support based on developmental screening results. And so we're talking, you know, ages birth to five, essentially, and 43% of those kiddos needed some sort of support um, with development. And so because we were able to identify them early, we've been able to provide early intervention services if it came to that, and also, you know, really making sure that they're connected with their primary care provider or specialist, as well as um, we offer transportation here in our department. So on my team specifically, I have a nurse and a health technician, as well as a family eligibility specialist, all who will be willing and are able to transport these families to medical, dental, um, special education service appointments, any of those kind of things, um, because transportation is limited for these families. So that is one service that we do provide them being enrolled in our Head Start programs um, to ensure that they're making their medical appointments and that the children are staying up to date on, you know, their chronic conditions, if it's asthma or whatever, that they have everything that they need and um, they're getting the best care possible. Next slide, please. So um, once we connected with the families, we also do, you know, we've partnered with community partners, but we also do referrals out. So I'm not sure what all of these dot, dot, dots are. So forgive me because I don't remember, um, but I'm going to guess it's health, disabilities. Um, it's going to be um, housing was 33%. I can guarantee that one. Transportation, um, helping them with education. All of those kind of things or referrals we were able to give to the families and assist them with obtaining um, those services so that they can make the community connections to become more self-sufficient and we can help them obtain those services and make that connection for them since they often don't speak the language or are not familiar with the area and not sure where to go to um, get the services that they need. Next slide, please. So again, these are just some of our um, community partnerships we've made. Golden Valley Health Centers has been huge. 
We also do work very closely with WIC. We have a contact person there and they do come out to our events as well to register families on site for WIC to be able to get those services. Um, CalWorks, we work with them. We have a, a contract with them to where um, we can, you know, um, move a little quicker, I guess we would say, for employment opportunities and getting them the public benefits. Um, and we're able to use our translator for those purposes as well, since many of our CalWorks staff do not actually speak the language. Family Promise is an agency that's helped us with housing assistance, which they're able to often pay the deposit or first month's and second month's rent for the families um, while they're getting established. Sherlock Unified has been great in supporting the school age and younger children and um, providing transportation and busing and really working with us to get the extra supports for any of the kids, especially the school age kids who are needing some more support because of language or they might be falling behind in class a little bit. Sherlock Adult School has been offering language courses to our families and they can register to learn English to assist them with getting a job. Um, IRC is our main contact that we work with to receive the information about newly arrived um, refugees and asylees. And then um, the, we have Stanislaus County Behavioral Health, who is also a social, social and emotional support services that they can provide to children and families. Next slide. I think, yep. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you so much. We appreciate your presentation. Moving on to our next presenter. Hello, I am being very aware of the time that it's 11.06 and we go to 11.30 and we wanna have time for some questions. Luckily, I'm usually the person that uh, is really good about making a long story short. <laughs> so I'm gonna do my best to share with you our experience, um, a little bit of our experience last year with welcoming our refugees from Afghanistan and some of the processes we have in place. My name is Michelle Einspar. I'm the program manager of the Office of Children, Youth, and Transition. And today, you can go to the next slide, I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, provide you with the context of our district as well as share with you some key points of collaboration and strategies used to overcome the challenges with serving our youth. I'll also share with you some of the resources that may be helpful for your programs to support your refugee and immigrant population experiencing homelessness. So my department, next slide, um, supports our youth in transition. This includes our students experiencing homelessness, our refugee immigrant youth, our military youth, and our foster youth. Um, one way we identify and provide supports for our students is we provide a needs referral form. I, I provided a link in the resources at the end for our schools so they can refer youth um, in transition who are in need of resources. Um, some of the resources we provide are backpacks, school supplies, hygiene kits, clothing. We also provide resources for housing and food resources. Our office also provides training focused on increasing awareness of the rights and needs of our students a lot. Um, what um, Kristen, um, our first presentation went over a lot of that. Um, our office also provides uh, training for our newcomer teachers uh, with strategies to help welcome them into school and facilitate resilience. And we offer trauma-informed care training that facilitates resilience. And not only do we reach out to our schools, but we reach out to our families in the shelters. And I'll talk a little bit more about our outreach last year. Um, a little bit on the context of our school district. Next slide. We're the second largest district in the state um, with close to 100,000 students. The data is a little old. Everybody experienced attrition and enrollment through the pandemic. We have 250 total schools with 200 uh, being district managed schools and nearly 27% of our students are English learners. Close to 8,000 students are experiencing homelessness in our district. And um, as has been shared, you know, you can't ask um, students for uh, documentation, whether they're to establish their immigrant or refugee. So it's, it's a challenging number to identify, but um, we, we guess we have around 3,500 students that are immigrant and probably 2,500 that would fall under the category of refugee in our district. Next slide. So San Diego has a longstanding history of welcoming refugees since the 80s. Um, 
we've welcomed over 85,000 refugees that have settled in San Diego County after the Vietnam War. We welcomed refugees from Vietnam. And I have to share with you with this outreach story, a guest teacher came up to me at one of the hotels and shared her experience coming in as a refugee and she was crying and just was so, felt so um, grateful to be a part of the process because she didn't experience the same thing, you know, when she came in the 80s. So that was, that um, was a uh, very, rewarding to to hear that feedback but that's just an overview of the timeline of different refugees that we we welcomed we also um under refugee status uh, office of refugee resettlement um students from haiti are their own category of refugee due to the gang violence um and siv status as well you know has been shared with the other presentations recently welcoming refugees from afghanistan and ukraine and a lot of different countries in africa as well so last year um, on the heels of, well, in the summer, there was the emergency evacuation in Afghanistan and our country initiated, initiated Operation Allies Welcome. And nearly since July of 2021, the United States has welcomed 95,000 refugees from Afghanistan. And initially they escaped to lily pads in different areas of the world and then came to various military installations in our country and then went where the family shared that they had connections across the country. So um, between October and February, it was close to um, 3,000 students from Afghanistan, I know the number has grown, that arrived in San Diego. So between January and March, um, on the heels of that Omicron explosion, we welcomed around 400 students in grades K through 12 that were living in about 15 different hotels, helping them to enroll to about 30 different schools. So next slide. Um, we have five refugee resettlement agencies in San Diego. What was different about last year's arrivals compared to across our context of history welcoming refugees is that due to the housing crisis, the refugees were not resettling in the City Heights area where they typically did. So they were struggling to find housing. So the resettlement agencies kind of had to scramble to find housing. And um, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Amanda Urena, who's here. Um, um, we try to lay the context and partner with our resettlement agencies to help them to understand um, that uh, students that they there there it was a paradigm shift for them I guess is what I'm trying to say um, they felt that they couldn't start school until they found their housing so in those we had a lot of really good conversations which helped to um, make those connections when they were you know going to the hotels. I'm going to um, skip the next slide because that was discussed in the first presentation about who our refugees are. Um, so um, I, I just want to emphasize again the importance of establishing the re relationships with the five resettlement agencies. The goal of the partnership is to create awareness um, and share resources to support the families with enrollment and needed resources. Um, one thing I want to mention is despite all the meetings, um, we became aware of the students in the hotels from our partnerships with other community organizations that support our refugee youth. And once that connection was made, then we were working, you know, hand in hand with the resettlement agencies to support the students. So you can go to the next slide. So um, the biggest lift was mobilizing boots to the ground support efforts to get children in school as soon as possible. Um, after brainstorming various options for connecting with families, we decided uh, we went right to the hotels, similar to the previous presentation and the motels, um, and worked with the resettlement agencies to know where the families were. And the hotels were really good about letting us use the rooms and even the copiers. Um, and we did this in a pretty short timeline. So high level of constant communication about um, next steps and um, planning the outreach. Um, some of the interdepartmental collaboration on the, nights, uh, the next slide, um, I'm gonna share with you a little more detail about what that looked like. So the next slide um, with our enrollment um, department, if you go to the next slide, our enrollment department ensured that the paperwork was completed. They had all the paperwork necessary um, most of the refugees coming at this time were humanitarian parolees, um, and we alerted schools uh, regarding special circumstances and 
you know, because there, you know, one school had, um, you know, it's a significant change needing to add classes and um, providing supports. Our transportation department um, on the next slide worked alongside with other departments to adequately determine the needs and set up bus routes to the hotels to bring the students to schools. And manifests were live manifests were created that were updated because many of the families did not stay um, in the hotel. They they were moved multiple times. So keeping up with that, that was a lot. What our office did. Next slide. Um, we coordinated with community agencies to provide resources. And at every hotel, we had a team that conducted a mini needs assessment to provide um, relevant information to the school sites to help smooth their transition. Um, we also participated in weekly, weekly county meetings to collaborate and address the needs of the families. Um, we did a big bike donation too, and clothing resources. There are many, fortunately, many wonderful um, community agencies that reached out to support our students. Uh, additionally, we coordinated with the newcomer orientation support for our students. So that was, um, a, we have a partnership with an organization called Global Village, which is a subsidiary of one of uh, Alliance for African Assistance, one of the resettlement agencies. And we provided this newcomer orientation support for students to help them adjust to U.S. schools. Not only that, um, increase awareness for staff around the cultural needs of new students. For example, um, you know, understanding that that providing a place for the students to pray midday um, was an important adjustment and learning for our schools. Um, and training was provided to teachers of newcomers, um, focusing on the importance of creating a sense of belonging and um, learning curriculum that was specifically designed for our newcomer students. Our multilingual education department on the next slide was also a part of the outreach and distributed age appropriate books for students and collaborated on professional learning with us to give strategies to teachers, um, including the importance of valuing the culture. We actually brought in one of the resettlement agencies that provided more context about the culture, religious beliefs, and um, typically the education level of the students and what they had experienced basically to get to where they are. Um, our nursing and wellness department, one of the biggest projects they worked on was with a partnership with Vision to Learn to provide screening and glasses for our students. Um, they also help with immunization records um, and ensuring um, compliance with pandemic protocols, um, a lot of good collaboration support with our, our nurses. Our special education department worked to expedite assessments and provide supports for staffing. We had students, we had a couple students. This is a picture of one of our students um, who is actually a high school student um, and just worked to expedite um, IEPs and interim supports for them while that was being processed. Our food services department was deeply involved ensuring that the dietary needs of students were addressed, um, whether it be a vegetarian and halal diet to ensure they had um, good food options while they were at school. School communities, our school sites were amazing, shifting to accommodate, this is again on the heels of Omicron, where our central office, everybody was like I said, boots to the ground supporting, I don't know if you all remember all the absences, you know, due to the Omicron explosion last year, but just accommodating the large increase of students and working with parent and community groups. I can't tell you the calls that we were receiving from just members of the community helping the families that were coming in to get to medical appointments, um, just supporting, helping to communicate um, when they had a move. Um, and the schools also coordinated with the different departments to ensure the supports for, for our students. Um, our communication department also supported the documentation of the arrival. And some challenges were obviously paperwork and ID, the uh, ID cards. Um, sometimes the birth dates weren't quite right. Um, I'm on the next slide. So just understanding the difference between the Gregorian calendar and the Islamic calendar, um, but, you know, solutions were utilizing our, our affidavit of birth certificate um, and just working with enrollment to accept the documentation and nursing um, to accept the different types of documentation um, that were created by the military bases and making sure our schools were aware of the cultural needs of our students. We continue to do that and provide training and awareness. The this slide shows that uh, just some pictures of the first day of school. 
Um, we did an orientation of how to use the bus um, and uh, alongside our partners, our newcomer orientation interpreters um, to help uh, students get ready for their first day of school. This next slide has a link to a video that, you know, I can talk all the time. I think I'm cranking through pretty good here. Um, it's just, I think it's a three minute and 45 second video that just kind of encapsulates the first day of school um, for our students um, last year, so. Denise, we are not seeing it on our end. Can you try to play it one more time? Still not seeing it. We'll give it one more try, and if not, we might we'll we'll have to share the link when we send out the presentation. Bummer. So that's pretty much the end of the presentation. Just links to some resources that um, you may find useful. Um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Again, connecting to those resettlement agencies is very critical to helping to identify and support students. Um, and then there's a list of refugee res resources by state. Um, Bridging Refugee and Children's Services has some very good resources on that site. And um, there's some resources that we put together to support our um, refugee students. The next page has a copy of our needs referral form that we use, our housing questionnaire, which is really uh, based on um, the CD website housing questionnaire, our newcomer orientation interpreter request form, birth certificate affidavit, and the, our refugee intake form that we used. Um, I wanted to mention caregiver affidavit with our unaccompanied undocumented minors is a, is a form that we use a lot to, I think a lot of school districts do. So. Um, Thank you for taking the time and here we go for 10, nine minutes. Of, yes, for yeah. nine minutes, we'll, uh, my plan is to read some of the questions that I have in the chat. And if any of the three of you feel inclined to answer the question. So the first one that was posted earlier was um, how can schools help unaccompanied children enroll in school if schools don't know whether they are unaccompanied youth. They particularly then go into the example of when enrolling, often schools require a guardian or a parent signature. And so how does that then play into the unaccompanied status? I'm happy to start out and answer and um, anyone feel free to jump in, but I would say, in that situation, if there's a, a youth coming in to enroll who is not with a parent or guardian, um, the very first thing is to involve the homeless liaison. Um, so the homeless liaison can ask the questions and do it in a way that's really appropriate and sensitive to the student's situation. Um, so that if the student is unaccompanied, that enrollment can happen immediately without um, a parent or guardian signature. And Michelle just mentioned a caregiver affidavit. And I know that we at Schoolhouse hear that many people use similar forms. Um, that really um, provides a way for somebody to be named kind of as an educational guardian for that for that youth. Um, so not necessarily giving any kind of parental rights or anything like that, but um, it's providing a way to have somebody to call in case of an emergency, somebody that might be able to help with attendance, things like that. Um, so that's a really great thing to have on file or to figure out um, if your district is using it or can use um, to kind of work with that needing somebody to be listed as a guardian. Um, but the homeless liaison is the best person that can get that student enrolled immediately without the required parent or guardian information. Thank you. In, in reference to unaccompanied youth, the following question was with regards to what if they're having trouble with birth certificates and other documents? Um, how can we, as the LEA, help them? We have heard recently that um, a number of students um, have had their documentation taken as they've entered the US. And so uh, very similarly don't have those vital documents. Um, 
Sometimes there might be options to work with a consulate in the area to get identification or birth certificates. However, I do wanna say that I recently spoke with someone at the Migration Policy Institute who said that they have been hearing um, that reaching out for the consulate to the consulate for that um, for the vital documents can affect immigration applications. So um, I would say that's one option to do with caution. Um, but if the student is coming from another country and has been in school in that country, um, one option is to reach out to the school in the other country to get those documents, to get that birth certificate, um, immigration records. You can even request transcripts that way. Um, I remember working with a school in Mexico with a student trying to talk through and compare. This is what we learned in this class. It sounds similar to this class. We want to give the student credit for it. Um, and so certainly reaching out to um, prior schools in other countries is, is a great way to do that. And they might have some of those documents on file. And there any, oh. I just wanted to add in working with our enrollment department, um, they do have options and solutions. And one could include a documentation from a medical doctor regarding birth, which might be difficult for students in that situation. But we also have a birth certificate affidavit, which I put the link on that on, on the presentation. Are there any scripts we can refer to when explaining homelessness um, in other languages? I think with AB 27 passage in California and having the housing questionnaire, I found that to be very helpful because that's kind of the piece. Um, we also have um, an enrollment card, but we have, um, I know our CD has the housing questionnaire translated in multiple languages. And we also did translate into a few more languages of the, to address the needs of uh, you know, our, our LEA, our school district. Someone said, thank you for the awesome idea. They love the bikes. So kudos. Um, others had uh, some references to how their districts are uh, using a platform uh, for interpretation of the languages. So please refer back to the chat. Um, there was the question around unaccompanied minors. Um, I think part of that is outreach to the agencies that support those groups. And when they when you make those connections to those agencies in your area, they're gonna reach out to you when they have a sponsor or the sponsor themselves may reach out to you um, for that information. So I think that that is tied in. It's challenging though. I'm not going to, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's almost like it's a hidden group. And even with our immigrants too, for fearful of, of being discovered of the situation that you're in. But I, I, I really feel it's a lot around connecting with those agencies that support those groups. Um, we have the California Department of Social, Social Services that offers funding, um, CalNU funds and Refugee School Impact Grant funding. Um, I think it's around, you might want to look at the CDSS website if you have a significant number of refugee and immigrant population um, where, where you can utilize to contract with agencies or even having partnerships with those agencies so you have that communication when, when they're being supported. How do we work with sponsors and how much are they responsible for students and youth, such as when it comes to attendance concerns? So unaccompanied youth that come um, and have a sponsor, I will say the sponsor typically doesn't have a lot of responsibilities in those cases. It's not the same as when a family from Ukraine, for example, comes with the sponsor, um, the financial responsibility, but many um, unaccompanied youth they come with a sponsor that may be um, a family member, it may be someone who's like a family member um, or a friend, and those sponsors really don't have any legal responsibility for that student. Um, in fact, we, we really believe that a lot of those situations can become toxic in the sense that um, they require, they may require children and youth to be paying back debts to them, to be paying certain household expenses, um, to be working, and to maybe going to school at the same time, or maybe emphasizing work as a priority. And so in that case, those sponsors really don't have, they have no legal responsibility for that student at all. Um, they, depending on the relationship with the sponsor, they may be somebody who could be um, that educational guardian who might be willing to take responsibility for the youth, um, but they also may not be. And so in that, in the case of the sponsor, I would say if, if the youth doesn't feel comfortable with that person being their educational guardian or having, you know, being able to call in attendance, 
Um, it doesn't have to be the person that they're living with. You could look for an educational guardian um, who might be somebody else in the community that they know, another family member or friend um, who could be um, who could be kind of that educational person to contact with attendance and other emergency related things. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be the sponsor depending on what that relationship is like. Is there a specific time frame for all immunizations to be completed for refugee students before they need to be excluded? I just answered this question yesterday for someone in California, so I will give you the um, non-answer that I gave for that as well. Um, the law, the language of the law does not specify a time limit. Um, Schoolhouse has requested some guidance from the US Department of Education because we know um, post pandemic there have been changes to, Im um, to immunization requirements. Um, so without having more information from the Department of Ed, um, we can't give any specific guidance, but I will say the language of the law does not specify a time. And so if families are really working on obtaining those immunizations, um, they're working toward that. I think that's that seems to be within the context of what the law says. Um, I think the situation is different if they're refusing Im immunizations altogether, um, but it's really important for schools then to help families remove those barriers so that they can work toward that. So um, unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about the time limit that is not, there's nothing in the law that specifies that at all. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed our webinar today. Please take a minute to give us your feedback and fill out the evaluation. You can find the QR code on your screen. Have a wonderful day. Hope we will see you again at our next webinar. Bye-bye, everyone.